Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time for some more Blood Sword. Now tonight we find ourselves with our merry companions in the last inn they're going to be experiencing for quite some time. They're going to set off across the frozen tundra and icy scrublands of the northern wastes. They've got some provisions and supplies for the journey, probably not quite enough. And I could probably make more space if I wasn't carrying the Dragonlord gem and somebody has the scroll of time blink. There we go. There it is. Ariadne has it. And without those, I could probably take some more food for the journey. I'll reread this section because it's where we left off last time. You push open the heavy door of the Fimble Winter Inn, grateful for the warmth that envelops you and quickly dries the chill from your bones. The common room is almost deserted, but the landlord, a short, thick-set man with a black beard, greets you cheerily. There is a crackling good fire in the half, he booms. Sit down, I will describe the tariff of this establishment. For a gold piece you may purchase supper, a small sum for the hot spiced ale, root cakes and Mercanian black pudding for which the Fimble Winter is famed. We have private rooms at the moment, for commerce is slack now with winter coming in. A room costs one gold piece, or you may sleep on the floor here in the commerce room for nothing. Decide whether you wish to have supper and or a room, and cross off the appropriate sum. You know what? Again, this might be more than just food. It could just be healing. But it's our last good night in a long time, and Remy's carrying all the money at the moment, so he can spend eight gold to give everyone a meal for the night and a room. Taking him down to 229 gold pieces, which is still a hefty sum for him to be carrying all on his own. So as with the um, with the seasickness, where eating a meal could be have a downside, this fine fare might have some upside beyond just recovering a little bit of endurance. Additionally, I'd like to note, um, in the last episode... There was no endurance loss for the party, right? There were plenty of options to replenish endurance after the previous fights we'd been in with the werewolves and the skeletal stalker. That Those healing opportunities are all great if we don't have a sage in the party. If we have a sage, hey, we could still fluff some healing rolls and those healing opportunities are all good. Why are we being healed up so much? Well, we're about to undertake a long, what, a three-day journey across a frozen wasteland. There's liable to be some loss of endurance there. So removing any previous damage will increase our chance of survival. That being said, <clears throat> any environmental damage we experience during this journey will make any actual threats and harmful encounters we experience all the more dangerous because we will not be at full capacity. That being said, should all the fights in the adventure be balanced around the party being at full health all the time? Probably not. The question is, does it feel like being at full health all the time makes it too easy? And I haven't been at full health all the time every fight, but almost every fight so far due to judicious use of healing. You'll notice I got two other books open because I want to point something out. In the new book five, you can use this ability once each time you turn to a new section, except when the section you've turned to involved com involves combat. Old book five, you can use this psionic ability at any time except during a combat. In all five of the old books, there is no mention of being only allowed to heal once per section, apart from combat sections. 
It's only in the new Book 5 that I've come across this. And yes, we have the Book 5 1d6-1 anomaly. I can't wait to see one of the new books 1 to 4 to see if the 1d6 plus 2 exists there or if the 1d6 plus 1 is now a standard which makes it more powerful but also if the once per section limit that once per section limit may exist purely because that changes to minus 1 I don't know anyway we've had a meal we've booked rooms let's rest Here we go for 31. Ah, just a little bit further. There we go. The landlord goes away and returns shortly with large flagons of mulled ale and slices of steaming blood pudding on the crumbly black turnip cakes of Eastern Craft. It is deliriously filling, and any player who bought supper recovers two endurance points if wounded. Again... We're in pretty good state, state already, but on the morrow, if it is cold, we might be asked, did you eat the blood pudding last night? In which case, take one less point of damage or something. I don't know, right? It may be as simple as just more recovery. Also, if we had not taken passage on that ship, on the Magdalene, and sought other means of crossing the ocean, we may have been wounded because those could be, I'm not going to say more dangerous, because the water elemental was pretty dangerous. So, there are various reasons why we could need to recover endurance points right now. The night is restful. When the snow begins to fall more he even though the snow begins to fall more heavily, and soon drapes the narrow windows in reefs of white, the landlord keeps his half as warm as a furnace. Each player regains lost endurance points equal to half his or her rank, rounding fractions up. You rise at dawn, refreshed by your sleep, and call to the landlord to bring breakfast. Again, we're not wounded, we don't need to restore endurance points. I do like the way Lone Wolf does this, where eating doesn't restore endurance points, but you take three points of damage any time you should eat and don't have any food. As you wait, an old woman hobbles into the common room and drops an armful of logs onto the fire. She brought them in from the courtyard, and they still wear the sheaf of ice crystals which hiss and spit as they catch a light. Watching the leaping flames, you could almost imagine pictures in them. First of a smiling woman with kind eyes, then a brittle-faced man with a malevolent glare. Ah, yes, murmurs the old woman, barely looking up as she passes you. Some see their dreams in the fire, others in ice. You turn to reply, but the landlord comes in with breakfast and you are distracted. Breakfast costs another gold piece, and players who eat it can regain another endurance point up to their normal endurance limit, of course. Just in case it helps, it probably won't. We'll eat a meal anyway. We can easily afford it. The landlord sits with you for a while, puffing at a pipe of tahak weed. When you describe your quest and where you must go, he offers advice. Head along the coastal cliffs. By dusk you will come upon a white mountain which marks the shore in summer. Look, looked at from one angle, it resembles a mother holding her child. And if you travel in the direction she seems to face, northeast that is, you will be on the pack ice. Two days or so should bring you to weird. All right. Hopefully his directions are good. Yep, there we go. Bidding the landlord farewell, you take up your belongings and set off. You have soon left the narrow cobbled lanes and high black walls of Dowerhaven far behind. The air is cold and crisp, 
but you are in good spirits as you trudge through the thick snow that blankets the fells. Late in the afternoon, you catch sight of the crag the landlord told you about. Not wishing to spend the night out on the pack ice, you make camp in its lee. The bleached daylight fades from the sky as you drift off. Towards midnight, you are awoken by a sweet singing. Far out to the east, you see three figures the colour of ruby dancing upon the snow. This is not natural, this is not normal, but I think we should investigate. Trudging nearer, you see that the three are a girl, a youth, and a tall, imperious man. The youngsters wear no warm clothing or furs as they dance barefoot upon the ice, and you can see that they are graceful and comely beyond belief. The tall man watches you approach, then spreads his red cloak wide. He fades, becoming first a bright scarlet haze, and then a shadow coloured like a fading ember. Then he is gone altogether. The girl and the youth sing wistfully as they dance across the pack ice. Their song is wordless but seems to speak of lost hopes, of broken dreams and faded grandeur. We could follow them, but if this man disintegrated, like faded away, that is really not a good healthy sign for us at all. Plus, they don't seem to be feeling the cold at all. We would absolutely feed the cold, and we'd wake up in the morning missing our beauty sleep. This feels incredibly dangerous and unsafe. Let's return to camp and go back to sleep and hope they do not follow us there, and hope that our fire keeps burning in the night and keeps them at bay. You awaken lethargically to find the morning heavy and grey. If you have rations, then you may take breakfast. Each player who eats must cross off one day's ration. Any player who does not have breakfast loses one endurance point. We have 14 days food. I think Brother Kern and Ariadne will eat. But Sir Alwyn and Remy will have to go without knowing that there's a long day's journey, well, a very long journey ahead of them. And Brother Kern will attempt a two-point healing roll. Oh, he gets two points back. Um, he'll keep them for himself for now, then. You pack up your camp, and then, turning your eyes to the northeast, you set out on the long journey to Weird. And long it may be. If you expected that the frozen surface of the... Oh, hey! You know what? I made a, a map. Let's put our heroes on our new frozen wasteland map. There we go. Bonk. Lovely. It's ice and snow, nice and slow. Look at the pretty sparkles. Now, interestingly, of the old woman saying some people see their dreams in fire, others in ice, there's actually something to that. People who have been out on the ice for a long time, often Arctic or Antarctic explorers, or people who've been out in, like, oh, what's that place, begins with an M, east of Russia. Well, you know, lots of places with lots of ice and snow. Um, they say that after you spend too long on the ice, you start to hear voices laughing, mocking you. Sometimes even seeing faces in the ice, looking at you, often laughing and mocking at you again. Um, and these aren't people who've talked to each other and, you know, shared their stories necessarily. This is, seems to be a sort of universal thing. 
a bit like people having a near-death experience, seeing the light and a feeling to want to go towards it. Now, it's possible some of these explorers have all come across each other's accounts and heard these stories and shared them around, but either way, it seems to be a distinct phenomenon. The ice seems to be malignant. Let's hope it's not too harsh on our heroes here. If you expected that the frozen surface of the Mistral Sea would be flat and smooth, you soon learn your error. It is an undulating expanse of pitted ice, as hard and as grey as iron. A shroud of sparkling snow lies over the petrified seascape, and sometimes the ice juts up in barotic tors and bergs carved by the wind. A persistent, keening gale rushes down out of the north, cutting through your clothing and chilling you to the marrow. Days and nights pass as you trudge ever nearer to your goal. You feel suspended like dust in a relentless white glare by day, stranded in an illimitable void by night. In all, you spend three days on the ice and the cold takes its toll. Each player loses five endurance points for each day with the following modifiers. One less point lost each day if we were wearing a fur cloak. One less point lost each day if you have rations to eat. One less point lost each day if you have a bedroll. One less point is lost each day if the party owns a brazier. Also, a player who does not own a pair of gloves will suffer frostbite and must subtract one from fighting prowess for the rest of the adventure. It is possible our warrior could have risked going without gloves to carry additional provisions, but he did not do so. Other party members don't quite have the fighting prowess to risk that. Any players who survive the three-day ordeal at last catch sight of land. It is the coast of Weird. So, five points a day, one for a cloak, one for rations, one for a bedroll, one for a brazier, which means everyone's losing at least one point a day. Now, everyone has a cloak and everyone has gloves. So everyone, we also have a brazier that Sir Alwyn is carrying. So that takes the five down to three a day. That's still nine damage each. Next up, we've got rations. Twelve days rations is four. Three times four is, yep, so everyone's got food. So we got cloak, rations. So it's five, four, three. Two for the brazier. And we have bed rolls as well. Excellent. So we'll gobble up all the food. Meaning that Sir Alwyn and Remy are taking six damage each. And Brother Kern and Ariadne are taking three damage each. Now, if we'd eaten some food in the last section, uh, sorry, if then some of us would be taking extra damage now. Now, this damage means that we are vulnerable, we're tired, we're weary, and it also means Brother Kern is going to make a two-point healing roll. Oh, that is really bad news for us. Now we get to an interesting point I've been wanting to bring up for some time about pacing. The amount of time we have between combat sections to allow us to recover health. Um, so pacing in terms of damage, in terms of healing, in terms of story beats. When it's good for a monster to appear. Huh. It's an interesting consideration. Because now, if we. It's uh, like in book one, we had the fight against Echidna, 
with the fight against Icon the Ungodly, potentially very soon afterwards. Which does also mean that any little sections asking if we have certain items or if we want to use certain items and so on, they're all part of the pacing too and allow for more healing opportunities. Hmm. But we have caught sight of land. And it should be just up here. The pack ice underfoot seems to become thinner as you approach the shoreline. There are none of the high and fanciful shaped ice tours, and in places you notice cracks through the ice to the chilly grey sea beneath. At which point we're going to try another two point healing roll. Excellent! We spend two, we get eight points back. Well, Brother Kern will give two of those back to himself, so now we have six points. Um. We put two here on the warrior, two on the trickster, and then one point each to Brother Kern and Ariadne. Thus we begin our recovery. You're a little over a kilometre from the coast when you spot a fur-clad figure lying on the ice. He is not moving. You had hoped to make all haste in order to reach solid ground before nightfall, but if you detour to see if this stranger is alive, then that may not be possible. We will absolutely go to see if this person is alive, because if they are, they surely need our assistance. You reach the stranger and roll him over. No, her. It is a young girl with raven-black hair, wearing a peasant's homespun under her thick cloak. She is very weak, and her flesh is as white as alabaster, but she is still breathing. If the sage wishes to heal her, he should roll for this in the usual way, and once she has regained at least one endurance point. So, here we can do our once per session heal, section heal, and then this implies additional healing rolls. We do have a brazier, but we're out of rations, so we can't use those to help warm her up. Okay, Brother Kern will attempt a two-point healing roll for the section. So that's for the party. He'll give them back to himself. And for her, loses two. Loses two, regains two, so he's going to be down one to ten. And then she'll get a point back. Because I can't really abuse this to heal the party a lot. At this point, I would really like to be able to heal the party a lot, because they are not on full health. Let's turn on to section 48. If we had some of that healing balm left that would be really useful however it would also take up valuable space that could have been taken up by supplies for the journey she is barely strong enough to speak but her mind is lucid i am from weird she says in a small voice i tried to escape along with my two brothers for our family had suffered too long under the Warlock King's tyranny. But the ice lacken rose up to slay my brothers, as it slays all who try to flee. Her voice trails off. You realize she is going into shock, a coma from which she will never awaken. She lost too much body heat before you found her, and no ministrations of yours can save her now. However... Brother Kern's healing has gone into overdrive because he's still on a healing risk. Two point healing roll loses it. Oh, we are so screwed. We are so absolutely screwed. If we run into trouble now, we are dead meat. Will you ask her a question? What is the ice lacken? 
this she just experienced she can probably she she has a name for it so it's a known phenomenon what is the source of the warlock king's power if if peasants like her know the source of his power they would have probably done something about it by now as he is a tyrannical ruler how can the warlock king be defeated again i do not expect her to know this she'll probably say he cannot be defeated or will you let her die in peace no we'll ask her what is the ice lacken A great monster that lurks in the sea below the ice. Its body is vast with a single eye set in the midst of eight long tentacles. Oh, that hideous eye. Her voice trails off, but we will attempt another two-point healing roll because... There we go. Uh... Brother Kern will give those straight back to himself to go back up to 10 endurance points because if the ice lacken that dwells beneath the ice, it's right here, isn't it? So we're glad we got a warning. Another section, another healing roll. Her eyes close as death comes for her at last. It is the very moment of sunset. You're sorry for her, but you have done all you can, and now you must get to the coast while you still have the twilight to see by. We could take her fur cloak and gloves, but we have our own already, and anyone who didn't have gloves would have already been suffering from frostbite. We'll go for another two-point healing roll, because damn, we need it. Um... Everyone else is healthier. Brother Kern will recover those two points back to himself. And we'll move on. You hurry towards the bleak grey cliffs that rim the shoreline of Weird. You feel a tremor run through the ice beneath your feet. Staring down, you see through the thick, distorting sheet of murky ice a single glaring red eye. Your hackles rise under its vile scrutiny, and you make another healing roll because bloody hell you're all hurt. Brother Kern, two points as usual, please. Excellent. Spends two points, gets six pack that back. That's four points. We'll give three to him. And... One more to... We'll give it to Sir Alwyn because he's slightly easier to hit than Remy. Suddenly the ice cracks at eight points in a circle around you, sending up a flurry of splinters as eight huge tentacles rise into view. Water's, water pours from the gigantic sucker pads as the tentacles thrash into the air and then stretch to converge on where you are standing. We could use an item... We could run to the shore, or we could decide to stand and fight. Well now, if we wish to use an item, we may have something incredibly valuable here. We have the white orb of fire, which we could place upon the ice and command to ignite and watch as it melts its way through, sinking dreadfully, slowly, towards that great red eye. But I think we're going to save it for a later opportunity. There may be an even better moment. That being said, we are all pretty much on 13 endurance points apiece, 14 for the warrior. We're nearly on full health. This may be a very risky fight, but we're going to undertake it. If we try and run for the shore, the tentacles have us surrounded, and I'm sure we'll take some damage and we might not even be able to escape. Let us do battle. The journey across the ice has weakened us. We are not quite at full capacity, so we'll just have to do the best we can. Oh! But since we are about to do battle, Ariadne is going to prepare a spell. 
And since she sees eight tentacles, she's going to use one of our good old book one favorites. Volcano spray. Because I imagine we'll be fighting these tentacles individually, like individual monsters. The fact they've got us surrounded and that monsters always attack the nearest target means we'll have to be very careful with positioning. So let's move Remy to the back and put Brother Kern and Ariadne in the middle because they're a little more vulnerable. And so Alwyn and Remy can stand around the edges and take a few more hits. You move quickly, turning your gaze this way and that. You must be alert to signs of impending attack from any or all of the eight tentacles. So I'm going to have to make a special map with a big red eye underneath, just because why would, would I not? The eight tentacles have a fighting prowess of seven and awareness of seven, so they're quicker than anyone except Remy. And two dice of damage. Armor rating of two. That is rough, actually. Probably should have gone with something bigger than Volcano Spray. Note that you are essentially fighting the Ice Lacken's tentacles as though they were eight individual monsters. In order to fight a tentacle, you must move to one of the holes where they emerge through the ice. Since the tentacles can stretch far overhead, they can fight any player, no matter where he or she is standing. This, the creature is immune to psychic spells, and we need to try and destroy six of the tentacles in order to survive. Right. This is going to be kind of rough. We will see how it goes. And I do have the scroll of Time Blink, which I may need to use. At least now we're not carrying two weeks of rations. <laughs> but we'll be on the shore and hoping beyond hope to find something we can eat. All right. I'll go sort out a battle map and I'll be back soon. Bye for now. Here's our map. Now, I know, I know the date has changed. It's tomorrow. Uh, last night, I ran the fight once, it went rough, and uh, I decided to use the scroll of time skip to go back in time to the start of the fight and try again. But by that point it was getting quite late, and I decided it would be a good time to end the episode, or at least stop recording and go to bed. Well here we are. I've had some spare time in the day when I wasn't able to record, but I was able to do some dummy runs of the fight, and it's basically an unwinnable fight. There's a couple of reasons for this, mostly due to the tentacles, unsurprisingly. So, Remy goes first, then all the tentacles attack all the heroes, and it's a bloodbath. Why is that? The tentacles have a fighting prowess of seven. This means they're hitting slightly more than half the time. And while the tentacles will randomize, if they are equidistant, there's going to be enough tentacles targeting the same hero, whichever hero that is, that generally one of the heroes will die in round two. Once, I managed to make it till round three before a hero died. Yeah. Now, potentially, we have three tentacles here victimizing the Enchantress. It's, so, originally my plan was for Remy to defend and draw the attention of a lot of the tentacles. He draws, like, that one, and potentially those three. So he needs to, instead of that, he needs to come down here and attack this tentacle to guarantee the attention of those three tentacles so that the Enchantress is less likely to be slaughtered. However, this means he is not defending and is much more vulnerable to attack. The Enchantress gets attacked by two. Bizarrely, these are the only two tentacles which can attack the Sage. 
bizarrely, the hero in position two is the least vulnerable in this encounter setup. So the way this basically plays out is Remy goes over here. Um, the tentacles attack and hit quite a lot. And the tentacles are doing 2d6 damage. And yes, we've got enough armor that we're theoretically taking only 3 to 5 points of damage every time they hit us. But they're going to get a lot of hits in. With an endurance of 11, our hero is doing 1d6 plus 2 for the warrior, d6 plus 1 for the sage and trickster, and just a straight d6 for Ariadne. And with an armor of 2... That means Sir Alwyn the Warrior can deal 5 damage on a maximum... No, he can do 6 damage on a maximum damage blow. The other two can only do 5. And yes, we could try using Brother Kern's quarterstaff technique to do an extra d6 damage. But trying to get a 7 or less on 3d6 is going to be really tricky. As we know, when we defend against these things and they have to try and do it. So the plan would be Remy moves down here, Sir Alwyn and Brother Kern move to attack this one, then Ariadne casts a spell. Now I made the mistake of preparing Volcano Spray, which for a single d6 damage to every tentacle you think would be good to finish off any that, yeah, for instance this one if it's taken a lot of damage. But with an armor rating of 2 that's 0 to 4 damage with a 1 in 3 chance of doing no damage. It basically doesn't even scratch for tentacles. So I would need to go into this fight with her using Sword Thrust instead of White Fire. Which would then be harder to cast. So what things do we need to succeed for this fight to work? We need Remy to go here and not get hit too much. Someone, by the, end, by the, by the time the tentacles have all had their turn, will probably be on four to six endurance points. Then we go here, and because the computer program for some reason likes rolling sixes and fives when the tentacles attack, so they hit a lot, and tens and elevens for their damage, and it likes rolling tens and elevens for Sir Alwyn's attack here against this tentacle in round one. Again, don't ask me why. <laughs> uh, it generally means that we're in a pretty bad shape by the end of the first round. If anyone has been hit three times in the first round, or Ariadne fails to cast her spell, we're screwed. I honestly think the best thing to do here is swallow my pride, go back to section 365, and use an item. To help with the situation. I really do. But I think it's only fair I show you a dummy run of how this goes through. And let's say, for argument's sake, that I had chosen to prepare Sword Thrust instead of Volcano Spray, because instead of choosing in the previous section which spell to use, I would look at the combat section, see the combat stats of these things and go, White, yeah, you know, Volcano Spray isn't going to really do anything, so I'll go for a damaging spell. So let's do a dummy run, right? If this goes really well, then I'll edit this bit out, and I'll tack it on after the original failed fight with the Scroll of Time Blink as a second attempt. And if it doesn't go well, I won't edit this part out, and you'll get to see me or swallow my pride, and I probably won't include the first attempt then. You know. So cool. All right, round one against the Ice Lacken. This is a very tough, challenging fight, I wanted to include it so you guys could see how hard it is, uh, but I probably should have just avoided this altogether. Let's see if things can go well. So first off, all of the tentacles have an awareness of seven. And they hit very hard, and they hit somewhat reliably. 
about as reliably as our sage. So we need to try and destroy a single tentacle in the first round to stand a chance. We also need none of our heroes to die in the first round. Actually, we need none of our heroes to die in the first two rounds to stand a chance. To destroy your tentacles, we do need to keep attacking. However, huh, it does get a bit tricky. So, Remy will go first. Now, Remy can stand here and hold the attention of this tentacle. These three tentacles could all target Ariadne. So ideally we want Remy to be closer to her, uh, closer to them. If we move him to here, he's closer to this tentacle and this one, and this one now. That one doesn't have a chance of going for him, but neither do either of these. So now there's only two that could target her instead of four. And if four of these target the same person, that's really bad. So Remy's moving here is purely positional. If he's still alive at the end of the round, I think he should attack again with quick re quick thinking and then go on the defensive because he's likely to be so heavily damaged that it will not look good for us. All right. So he slips and slides on the ice towards the tentacle and slices of his sword and lands a blow. That's a good start. Let's keep things positive here. Now, of course, he deals a mere 1d6 plus 1. Additionally, with quick thinking, he could also shoot the 8th tentacle if it's badly wounded. Uh, two points doesn't get through its thick, rubbery exterior. And now the pain and hardship begins. The first tentacle will attack Sir Alwyn. And mercifully, it misses. I'm going nice and slow because I'm hoping, for some reason, that if I pause long enough in between rolls, they'll continue to miss. The second tentacle will obviously attack Ariadne. And also miss. This is very positive. The next three tentacles will attack Remy. But because he's the trickster, it's ever so slightly harder for them to hit him. The third tentacle misses. The fourth tentacle will now make its attack. And the fifth one, likewise, will hit our trickster, I'm afraid. So he is taking 10 damage. Here we go. The tentacles have begun already. So that's 8 damage after armor takes him down to 5 endurance. Meaning, at this point, he is on purely defensive actions unless he can do a really good job. Now, of course, if one of the heroes goes down, or two or three of them, as long as we win, we can use the optional rule to allow everyone to survive. Unfortunately, when there's this many tentacles attacking us, it's all about the action economy, right? We need to ensure that we can kill tentacles faster than they can take us down. And we don't have the damage to do that. The sixth tentacle will attack Ariadne and will mercifully miss. The seventh tentacle will randomize a target. Remember, top to bottom and left to right. So between Sir Alwyn and Brother Kern, two for Brother Kern, one for Sir Alwyn. It goes for the healer. Of course it goes for the healer. And it misses. Hooray! We're on to a winner here, boys. Or are we? I don't know. And the eighth tentacle, finally. I didn't even select the seventh one for luck. Right. We'll also randomize targets, same numbers as before. It goes for the warrior. And of course it hits because it's going to roll really high for damage now, isn't it? Nine! Of course it rolled high for damage. You see, it likes to mess with me. It's horrible. So that's going to be six damage after armor, taking him down to eight endurance. He can just about afford to attack after that one once. So Sir Alwyn will move to here. So we got two important things, right? Number one, kill a tentacle. Number two, get out of the middle of the circle. 
At this point, map tool is likely to make me miss. So Alwyn raises his sword and brings it down upon the tentacle and only just hits because it's a magic sword and he's got proper warrior training. Let's see what sort of damage we're looking at here. Okay, seven is a respectable amount of damage. It's five after armor. Takes it down to six endurance points. At which point... Brother Kern will move in to attack the same tentacle. Hopefully, that's a hit. That's good. 1d6 plus 1 is 4 damage. That's 2 after armor, taking it down to 4 endurance points. Now, this means that... We could theoretically kill this tentacle next turn with a single hit from either of these two. We'd need to roll a 4 for the warrior or a 5 for the sage. If Remy could shoot this with an arrow, a magic arrow from his magic bow, before defending, he could kill it on a 5 or 6, and then maybe, if he doesn't, Volcano Spray could finish it off from Ariadne. But as I said, I blatantly swapped it to Sword Frost. Now, the Sword Frost spell will do 3d6 plus 3 damage. So that's essentially 3d6 plus 1, or an average of 11.5. It should kill any tentacle on a good dice roll. Not even a very good dice roll. And, in order to protect our Enchantress, she probably needs to destroy one of these tentacles here. Probably this one, because she needs to be preparing and casting spells, so we... Yeah. So first off, let's see if she can successfully cast Sword Frost. 2d6 plus 2, because it is a complexity level 2 spell. She fails to cast Sword Frost, and now we are all doomed, because all the tentacles still have their turn. So at the end of the round, we'll have Remy take his second action to fire an arrow at the Wounded Tentacle. Oh, I haven't corrected arrows back from after the... Had five arrows, used two in the previous attempt at this fight. Also, I haven't given her back the scroll of... Time Blink. So he loads and looses an arrow at that tentacle in the hope of finishing it off. The magic bow gives him plus one fighting prowess for shooting, so that's a hit. We will now do some damage from this arrow, this all or nothing Hail Mary shot. Five points is free after armor, the tentacle survives. After which Remy defends because he wants to be alive at the end of a fight. Next we get the second wave of tentacle attacks. The first tentacle will attack Sir Alwyn. And unsurprisingly it hits for 7, minus 3 is 4 damage. He now needs to defend. I think you can see where this is going. The second tentacle will attack Ariadne. Let's see who dies first, at least it misses. The third tentacle will attack Remy, who is defending, and therefore the hardest target in the game. That's a miss, that's good. The fourth tentacle will attack Remy. We're going to see a lot of this. Great! He evades that one as well. The fifth one flails in his general direction, and he, nimble like a jaguar, avoids the damage. The sixth tentacle, on the other hand, goes for our vulnerable enchantress, fully intent on murdering her, and misses. This is great. Also, she successfully cast a spell last round. No, she failed. Okay, the seventh tentacle will attack Brother Kern because he is its closest target. That is also a miss. We're doing great. 
And the final tentacle will randomize and pick the warrior who is already wounded and hit and do unbelievable amounts of damage. After armor, that's still 8 damage. That's twice his current endurance. And at that point, we are doomed. Right? It is possible these three could take out loads of tentacles. But not very possible. So there we have it. I'm going back to section 365 and using an item because this is basically an unwinnable fight. Remember also the heroes come into this one pre-damaged from the journey across the ice. We should be eager to avoid a harmful conflict and this is an extremely harmful conflict. Uh, so instead of preparing volcano spray and trying to come into which would just glance off the armor rating 2 on the tentacles and not do enough to seriously harm them. Let's go see what we can do with items. I absolutely wish to use an item because this is a horrible, horrible fight that we are not going to survive. It's possible we might win with one or two people alive, but highly unlikely. Now, I should probably just go back to the beginning of the book and start playing again and go, OK, look, party's dead. Play the fight out fully and depressingly to see if anyone can survive at all. In fact, I should have probably turned to this section anyway for an extra healing opportunity before deciding to fight because the option to fight is still there. So, we absolutely... Okay, this is a very dangerous situation. We should absolutely make a one-point healing roll, not two, in case we roll very low. And, of course, we roll very low. Why am I not surprised? The fig tentacles snake in towards you, but you keep your thoughts calm as you consider the item that might be of use to you now. We can activate the Orb of Fire. We do not have a Scroll of Invisibility. We have a Harp. We have two blue eye jewels that we gained from the Skeletal Stalker. I'm not sure the undead eyes of the Skeletal Stalker, which were probably able to see us if we used magic to conceal ourselves, I don't think they're going to be much useful against this thing here. It's clearly not some kind of illusion the dead girl told us about her dead brothers, and she was clearly badly damaged by it as well. The harp may soothe the strange creature. But I already alluded to the use of the orb of fire, and the only reason I didn't use it earlier is I wanted to try and save it for later. I think now is the time. Let's do it. And to be fair, it's a pretty epic use of an item. You murmur the word of power that energizes the orb. It grows hot immediately, forcing you to drop it at your feet to avoid a serious burn. It sizzles as it hits the ice, but even the arctic cold cannot cool its fire. White flames envelop it as it grows to incandescent heat, throwing up a billowing cloud of steam from the pack ice. For a few moments, wrapped in your thick clothes, you experience a wave of sweltering near-tropical heat. The huge red eye under you blinks uncomprehendingly as the orb sinks through the melting ice towards it. An inhuman scream of agony splits the air, the bubbling screech of the blinded monster. The tentacles thrash madly like corn in a storm. You make a dash for the coast as the ice quakes and cracks beneath you. 
Glancing back, you see that the monster has broken through the ice and pulled its gigantic body out of water, squirming blindly in unendurable pain. You have no pity to spare for a creature such as that, but at least you do not bother to gloat over its froze. Turning your back on it, you walk on to the shore. And we're going to try another one point healing roll for Brother Kern. Excellent. Spends one point, gets four back. Um, let's just give one to himself, two to himself, three to himself. And then one to Remy. So yeah, um, I could have replayed the book leading up to this. You know what, let's stick with this order for a bit. But I would have probably done it off camera to avoid repetition for the audience, unless I was making different choices. And would have probably ended up in a fairly similar situation to the one here. And honestly, avoiding the fight and just using an item feels like the best. Who has the orb of... She had the orb. It's gone now. Somewhere deep inside the monster's body. Either that or it managed to shake it out of its eye socket at some point, but... That thing is a threat to us no more. And with that, honestly... I'm going to end the episode here and get it uploaded. It should have been up yesterday. I hope you all enjoyed this one, even if I did kind of wimp out on the fight in the end. And I'll look forward to seeing you all in the next one. I'll say goodbye for now and cheerio, everyone. See you all soon.